Good morning. Welcome to worship. We have a wonderful opportunity to worship the King of Kings this morning. Oh, worship the King. Sing this hymn together. Let's stand. Redeemer and friend, let's uh, worship him, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Oh, would you just lift up your voice and praise today?
praise him and we enjoy the song. Would you be seated where you are, please? Let's continue our time of worship as we approach the Lord in prayer. Our memory verse this week from our rooted journals in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 where it says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And so one of the beautiful things about a relationship with Jesus is that God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us, and to give us power to ever experience victory through the battles of life but also to be able to love as Jesus has loved, but also to defeat the temptations in our life through the power of Jesus. So let's spend some time this morning thanking the Lord for that, but praying through some of these this morning. Father, we come before you this morning worshiping you with a worshipful heart this morning, desiring to honor you, Father, to give you the glory that you so rightfully deserve. God, we are grateful that in your majesty and in your glory, you remember who we are. Lord, we are created in your image. In the image of God, we are created. And Lord, we are thankful for the promise, Lord, that you have given us in a relationship with you, the, the, the promise and the gift of salvation. And Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to teach us, to walk with us, to guide us. And Father, we're grateful this morning that we don't have to, to live in fear. But God, but because of what you have done, we can live victorious. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you give us the power, as the word says, power to be able to experience victory in the, the dark times of life. But Lord, also to love as you have instructed us to love. But Lord, also we're, we'll spend more time talking about in a moment being able to experience victory over temptation in our life. And Lord, through your spirit, Lord, you give us that spirit of self-control in order to honor you that our relationship with you may be rich and it may be full. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that as the God of the universe, Lord, you have invited us into a love relationship with you. And God, I pray that out of the overflow of that relationship, that it would fuel and drive us into your arms. God, thank you for this moment that we have. Father, for the moment that we have to pray. Father, to lift our voices in prayer, to sing praises to you this morning, to exalt you. But Lord, also the opportunity in just a moment to, to open your word and to walk through it. And Father, that your spirit may apply the truth to our heart. Father, we thank you. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. Don't know where you're weak. But we've come to worship a God who is stronger. There is love that came for us. Let's sing it together. Sing it with us. There is love.
says that he's been given a name above all names. So let's in worship this morning. Lift his name. Let your name be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher. understand that and can sing that to one another, we can declare he is worthy of our worship. Would you sing this with us?
so grateful this morning that we can declare in song that Jesus is Lord. Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy of our worship and he's worthy of our praise. God, I pray that as we have sung truth about you this morning, God, that our response to that truth has been to pour out our worship to you, to declare um, that, that you are truly worthy of our worship this day. God, I pray even now as you continue to pour out your revelation of yourself through your word in the sermon this morning, God, I pray that our response would be worship and obedience to that word. May you be glorified in it all. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we get started this morning, I'm going to go ahead and pick on you first thing. Okay, you ready? Uh, because I'm going to probably call some of you out this morning, get a little bit personal, but I think you guys are big boys and girls and you can handle that this morning. And what I want to tell you is this, is I have come to the realization and understanding and have accepted the fact that there are some of you in this room and there are other people that may not be in this room that, well, I know that are not in this room, that are enamored with celebrities. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You are the same people that when you go to the grocery store checkout line, you always make sure you read the front cover of the National Enquirer. Y'all don't all look at your shoes at one time now, okay? But there are some of you who are just enamored with celebrities. There are people who are enamored with celebrities, the people that track their every move, what's going on in their private lives. There's an entire industry built on this. And some of you maybe have heard of the media outlet called TMZ, and they like to be the first on the scene for every major event that exists to exploit the lives of celebrities. Now, TMZ is not a small company. Actually, about 55 million people visit their website every month. And then several hundred thousand people watch their TV show every night. And what they want to do is they want to follow celebrities around. And, they, and what they're really looking for is, is one thing as they follow those celebrities around. What are those celebrities going to do to mess up? What are they going to do to mess up? There's always something going down. There's always a new scandal. There's always a new addiction, a new affair, some new development that's, that surfaced. And TMZ is one who wants to share all the juicy details with the American public. And I know it's strange. And, but when I see those things and I see the life of those, quote, celebrities unfolding, I begin to scratch my head sometimes. Maybe like you, you just kind of... Oh, you just don't get it. You just don't understand it there. How could they do that with all the, the money, with all the fame and all the cars and the houses? Why are these people still messing up their life? And then I say to myself, I would never do that. I, I would never do that. But then I read the book of James, Mr. Raymond, and I see myself there in the book of James. And I realize that James is beginning to describe for you and me this morning a very dangerous road. A very dangerous road. And these things that we see all over the news, and they, they don't just, these people don't just end, their, end up there one day. They don't, they don't just show up and it happens. It's kind of a process that begins to take place in their lives. And so we come to James chapter 1. We want to start reading this morning in verse 13. I hope that you have your Bible with you, so let's read together. The scripture says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, some of you are thinking, Pastor, 
didn't we talk about these verses last week? And I'm so proud of you that you remember what we talked about last week. That's always a goal for me. Do you remember what we talked about last week? And yes, we did use these verses last week. So if you weren't here last week, I want to encourage you to go back and to listen to what we talked about last week. And uh, last week, we looked at the difference between temptation and trials. And for the first several verses that we see here uh, that we talked about last week, James is specifically talking about this idea of trials in our life. And that's where we were focused. So this week, what we want to do is we want to kind of transition a little bit there. And we want to talk about what does it look like for you and I to deal with temptation in our life. Temptation is something. It's something that everyone in this room can relate to. And here's what I want to say. And I want us to be honest up front this morning. What if, just what if today, God is going to set some people free from those temptations? Do you believe that can happen today, friends? Now, we all got dressed up. I put a sport coat on, and I never wear one unless I'm going to church. I got dressed up and shaved my face a little bit this morning, combed my hair. We get all dolled up, and we get all fancied up to go to church for some formal activity. But what if, just what if God wants to show up this morning? Are you ready for that? Some of you got really uncomfortable by me saying that, and I don't make that lightly. I'm, I'm serious. What if God wants to show up in your life this morning? He wants to deal with some things in your life. And this ought to be a place that we can do that and we can do that safely. Maybe you walked in this morning and there's no way that you feel like you can resist the temptation of the world. But I believe that God can set us free from those things. And if, and if not here, why not? Why not here? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at these verses and we're going to, to take a look at four ways to deal with temptation this morning. And so here's the first one, and it's kind of a recap of last week. First of all, we must recognize for what it is and what it is not. Verse 14 again, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Now, we need to define some terms, just as we did last week, temptations. And here's what temptations are. They are opportunities to choose something other than God. So as we begin our deep dive this morning into the dealing with temptation, we have to define what it is and what it is not. So let's define that. First of all, temptation is experienced by everyone. Every one of us in this room have experienced temptation. We know it because if you know the story of Jesus particularly, right before he begins his public ministry, after he is baptized, we read in the Gospels that Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. And the Bible tells us that he was tempted. God in the flesh came to earth and it says that he himself was tempted. And the reality is, you and I, we live in a world, temptation is part of the deal. The world is broken and temptation is a part of, there is constantly right now, for you and for me, opportunity every single day to choose something other than God. Temptation is experienced by everyone. But here's the second truth. Temptation is not sin. Again, we know that because we know that Jesus was sinless as the Son of God, and we know that he was tempted in the wilderness, but yet he was without sin. So again, how do we combat this temptation? We see it in the life of Jesus. Jesus gives us an example. Jesus could have just told the enemy, hey, get lost, but he didn't do that. He gives us an example. Every time the enemy tempts him with something, he combats it with what? He combats it with the Word of God. And that's important for us as believers because we're not just going to be able to fight the devil by ourselves. We're not smart enough to fight temptation by ourselves. Jesus combated temptation in his life with the word of God. Resistance is possible and you and I can resist temptation through the word of God. But here's the third truth. Temptation is not from God. And again, we talked about this last week that God can bring those, be the source of our trials, but he never tempts us. 
There are times when God will bring trials into our lives, but God is never going to be the source of our temptation. That's what verse 13 says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Satan, we know, though, on the other hand, is a liar. He is the father of all lies. He tries to tell you that that thing that's out there in front of you that looks so good is that God has put that out there. And the word of God literally tells us that here that temptation is not from God. But here's our fourth truth. Temptation can be used by God. And this is a good place for us to, to, to camp out for just a minute. If you've ever failed, and by looking around the room, I could tell that all of us in this room have failed. We've all missed it. We've all had times in our life where we have messed up. When we succumb to temptation, even God can use those moments. Even in our mess, even in our mistakes, even when we fail, the Bible says his grace is sufficient for us. So what does it mean that his grace is sufficient for you? What that means is no matter how far that thing went, no matter how deep that thing got, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, just maybe today you need to hear that. You need to hear the truth of God's word today. But did you notice there, there, there's not an exception clause in that particular verse there for your sin? And here's what I mean by that. It doesn't say we know that God causes all things to work together for the good unless it was really, 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 really bad. Then God can't use that. That's not what it says, does it? It doesn't say we know that God causes all things to work together for good unless it's the same thing you've been struggling with for the last 10 years. It doesn't say that. Why don't you just get your life together? Can't you just beat that? It doesn't say that. Maybe even this morning as you've walked in, maybe you've done really well today. You feel like you should get an award today because how well that you have done spiritually so far today. Or maybe you came in here today and you are battered and you are bruised. And you feel like this week or this month or maybe even the entire year of 2020 has been absolutely terrible. Everything that could go wrong is going wrong. And here's what the Bible teaches us this morning. God is using that for your good. Maybe today you walked in God's grace and you resisted temptation. You walked in holiness and you are free and you came to worship and you came this morning with a worshipful heart. God is using that for good. But maybe today you failed epically. You, you messed up. You succumbed to temptation. You walked in all kinds of sin and you're just here and you're just trying to see if there's anything left for you. You need to hear this morning that God's grace is sufficient for you. You need to hear that. Maybe that's what you came and you needed to hear that today. So what's, so that's what temptation is and what temptation is not. But here's the second way that we deal with temptation. The second way is this, is that we have to take responsibility for it. Like we talked about last week, there were three sources of temptation. And we don't have time to unpack all of that. You can go back and listen. But there are three sources of, of lies of temptation that we talked about. One of those is the world. We, we all know that we live in a broken, jacked up world. And, the, and that's the system and the structure of the world of, of sin that tempts us day in and day out. Another one of source of those temptations is Satan himself. We have a very real enemy and he exists to tempt us. And the Bible says that he is a liar and he is the father of all lies and he is the source of temptation. But then there was a third one that we talked about. And it's the one that we don't like to talk about a whole lot. And that's the man and the woman in the mirror. Our hearts. Your heart will lie to you. We, we've all seen the coffee cup saying that say, just follow your heart or believe in yourself. Or if you're a millennial here, just find your truth. That's the, the motto of that generation. But even as followers of Jesus, we eat that stuff up. 
We live in a self-care, self-love, self-help world that there all of a sudden we all think that we're really awesome. And here's what the Bible just said in verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Notice what it did not just say in that passage there. But each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by the evil world. Is that what it says? No. Or he is carried away and enticed by that pesky devil is that what it says no it's not what it says but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what his own desire that word desire a, a lot of times we automatically go to sexual lust and that is definitely included in that this word desire really means to be lured away by our own sinful heart. And that's hard for us to grasp, especially in a culture that we live in when we always want to blame somebody else for our mess ups. We are natural blame shifters. We don't want to take responsibility for our actions. And this is an ancient struggle. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden to our great-grandma and grandpa, Adam and Eve. If we were to go back and to read that, and if you don't know the story, that story is placed in the Garden of Eden. And the, Adam and Eve were in perfect harmony with God. And God just gives them one command. One command. Don't eat of that one tree. You can have all the rest of them, but that one tree, don't eat of it or you'll die. It will mess you up. And we know the story. The serpent tempts Eve and she eats and then she gets her husband Adam to eat and they see that they are naked and they feel ashamed and sin enters into the world. And I know that I'm kind of breezing over a massive theological concept, but you can go back and read those first few chapters of the Bible. Sin enters the world, but we pick up that story in Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. Listen to what it says. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Adam the blame shifter that he is immediately says, the woman that you, God, the woman that you gave me. Guys, if you're newly married or married, this is an epic fail right here, okay? Do not take your, your advice and wisdom from that right there. And God comes to this man and says, Adam, take responsibility. And then what does Adam do? God, that girl that you gave me, she messed this whole thing up. And I think we're only laughing on the inside but we would do the same thing. And we do the same thing. Then he goes to the woman and he said, what is it that you've done? And what does the woman do? What does she say? It was the serpent. It wasn't my fault. Don't look at me. And so we fast forward a few hundred generations and, I'm, and we're still doing the exact same thing. Taking responsibility in our culture is like a cultural sin. Nobody wants to do it. That politician is wrong. That person is wrong. That news anchor is wrong. Every hater on your Facebook page, every crazy commentator on your Instagram, the people in your workplace, the people in your home, God help us, the people in your church, our church, it ain't my fault. Some of you can remember, and some of you are looking forward to, when you first leave your children at home by themselves for the first time, not, I'm not saying you go off for the weekend and they're all by themselves, but i got to run to the grocery store, right? Well, it's, it's a great moment. It's a proud moment. That's a benchmark moment, right? Right, moms? Okay, you can keep your kids 24 hours if you want to. But that was a great day in the Spencer household, let me just tell you. And you would leave them and you came back and it looked literally like World War III just took place. Right? And as you ask the kids what happened, every one of those little crumb snatchers said, It ain't me. It wasn't me. It was him. It was her. Right? 
And I'm thinking to myself, so I guess we just have some boogeyman that likes to just come throw trash and laundry all over the house. That's just kind of what we have going on here. We've all been there, parents. But adults, it may not look like a messy house to you, but we all got pretty messed up hearts. And we don't want to take responsibility for that. We thought that if we just grow up a little bit, it'll, it'll change. And we hear the common excuses. Well, everybody else is doing it. That's exactly what Adam said. And it's kind of weird, but everyone in that particular situation was him and his wife. That was everyone at that point, right? So how about this one? The devil made me do it. That's exactly what Eve said. And here's what James is saying. He is cutting right through our culture that wants to tell us that we are awesome all the time. You and I are tempted by our own sinfulness. And if you're honest, and you're willing to be honest today, just like me, Greg Spencer is his own worst enemy. I can try to blame everyone around me, but as I'm trying to risk temptation, most of it's coming from me. Now, I don't want us to just camp out on the bad news. So here's some good news for you. You ready? If you're here today, and as a follower of Jesus, he has promised us a gift. And that gift is himself in the nature of the Holy Spirit. When you gave your life to Jesus at the moment of salvation, the Bible says that you were given the Holy Spirit of God to indwell your life. God now resides in you. And some of you are thinking right now, man, I don't feel like God is inside of me. That's because the Bible says that also that this old sin nature, this old messy sin nature that we have, it never goes away either. And so there seems to be a, a constant war between the Holy Spirit of God and me and the, and the flesh. And when I'm talking about being tempted by our own selves, I'm talking about that ugly nature that we still carry around until the day that we meet Jesus face to face. And that's the flesh. And that's why we looked at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 last week that says this, The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. But all this talk about bad news, some of us think to ourselves, man, I'm not that bad, am I? Am I really that bad? And then you may fast forward in your life about five minutes, and then you come to the realizations, man, I just thought that. I just had that thought. It is that bad. It is that bad. And then you realize it's worse than I thought. And the hardest part about this, as we wrestle with the flesh, nobody talks to Greg more than Greg. And you can insert your name in that blank. I'm not talking about walking around like a, like a crazy person. I'm talking about through my thought life and through your thought life. Nobody talks to you more than you. A study back in July of 2020 from Queen's University in Canada by a group of psychologists suggested that every human being has over 6,000 thoughts a day. It's a lot of thinking. You know what that is? That is 6,000 opportunities every single day to be lured away and enticed by my own sinful desires. To deal with temptation, we can't shift the blame. It's actually good to get to the place where we go, man, I'm that bad. Because at that moment, it shows that we have a desperation for Christ. And when I realize how bad I am and I realize how good God is, that gets me on my face every morning saying, God, I need you. I'm not trying to put on this front as some perfect person who doesn't need you. I'm in trouble every morning. I I'm coming to you because I understand how wicked and how sinful I am apart from you. So every morning we're getting in the word and we're saying, God, help me to be a better husband. Help me to be a better father. Help me to be a better pastor, a better citizen of the kingdom because I need you. You understand how bad things really are and it drives you, friends, to that which is good. And that is God himself. 
We have to take some responsibility in, as we deal with temptation. We can't just keep shifting blame because we never deal with the issue. And here's the third way that we deal with temptation. It's this. We must realize how it works and where it leads. Look at verses 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You know, a lot of times, you and I, we will see sin as one single event. But God is showing us here through the book of James that it's not just one single event. It's a process. And so let me explain it to you. Nobody stands at the altar on their wedding day. And right before they say, I do, they want to make sure that they have their divorce attorney on speed dial. Nobody does that, right? Nobody does that because nobody says, well, I'm going to get divorced tomorrow. Why? Because it's a process. It's not a single act. Nobody takes that one sip at a party and starts planning out the AA meetings that they're going to go start attending when they realize that they're addicted. It's not a single act. It's a process. That affair that started on Facebook or Instagram probably didn't start as a full-blown affair. It probably started as a friend request and maybe a like and then a, then a follow and it quickly became secret and sinful and, and we see it as a single act, but God sees it as a process. But here's how it continues. It continues with deception. And that's what verse 14 is talking specifically about here. We are being lured away and enticed. And as you study these words, and as you look at that, a lot of the commentators, when I was studying this, agreed that this is talking about a fisherman and how he catches and he lures uh, fish with his bait. Now, Greg is, is not a fisherman. Uh, matter of fact, some of you in this room, love, how many of you like to fish and think it's just unstressful? Fishing is one of the most stressful activities for me. It is stressful. So stressful, I had to borrow a fish bait. How about that? And Richard pulled this out of uh, his truck somewhere. But this is a nice bait. Now, it takes a big fish to eat on this right here. But just think about fishing for just a moment because I believe that's what James has in mind when he's talking about and he's writing this particular passage here. He's talking about this. If you're a fish that's hungry, and you see this in the water, and you're hungry, you're thinking to yourself as a fish, I'm about to hit the jackpot. This is the buffet of all buffets right here. Talking about the idea of being lured and being baited away here. And this big old fish, what he does is he begins to, to chomp down what he thinks is going to be an amazing meal, right? But what they do not see are these big three shiny treble hooks on the bottom of this particular lure. And so here's the picture. That fish saw something that he thought looked good. That's going to satisfy me. That, that's it's going to be what I need. And he doesn't see beyond the bait at the hooks on the bottom that are about to kill him. Nobody approaches these things that go, man, I can't, a fish, no pro, a fish approaches this and says, man, I cannot wait to end up on Tim Hodges' plate on Friday night. Nobody says that. No fish does that, do they, Tim? One of them did, <laughs> right? Nobody, no fish does that. Nobody does that. But here's the reality. This is real in our life. Some of us right now are chasing things that look really good. They look really good, and they look like everything that you want. They look like everything that you could possibly ever need. We can try to blame the devil, and we can try to blame the world, but the reality is my own sinfulness is leading me to think that I need that thing, or, or I want that thing, or that thing is going to satisfy me. That thing is going to make me feel good. I have no idea that as soon as I bite on that hook, it's going to get me. This thing is not what it promised to be. It's bait. But it, allure, though, continues with deception. And then it results in disobedience. Because when I jump on whatever that is, 
What started in my sinful heart, it takes root into my mind and it's made its way out of my life, whether through my hands or through my thought life. I camped out and I shouldn't be there at that moment. The Bible says there in verse 15, its end is death. Now, it may take moments. It may take even years. It may even take days. But the end result of giving into temptation, the word of God says, is death. But I know what you're thinking. You may be saying, well, I've sinned. I've given in to temptation in my life, but I'm not dead. I'm not physically dead. What, is, what does it mean by death? It, 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 maybe it's not physical death. It could be, but, but maybe for you it's the death of a relationship that means a lot to you. Or maybe it's the death of, of trust within a particular relationship. Maybe it's the, the death of your integrity because you know now you have to rebuild your integrity because the people around you can't trust you because you bit into something you had no business biting into and death came. And we think, well, it's, it's just a little taste. It's just a little flirtation. Maybe you even said to yourself, it's not hurting anybody. Maybe right now you're thinking this little thing that you've got going on on the internet, it's, it's not really hurting anybody. It, it's my own secret. Nobody will ever know. The reality is, is we have to take God at his word. We don't take sin seriously because we don't believe what the Bible says. The Bible says that if you bite into that, it leads to death. And that's why James, he says in the next sentence there in verse 16, do not be deceived. We're so easily deceived. We laugh at the, the goofy little fish story here, but you and I can think of things right now, things that, that may not look necessarily like a lure there, but it, it's the same perspective. It's got the same effect. You think that this thing is, is going to satisfy you, whatever that thing is. And some of you right now are not seeing beyond the bait. Just what if maybe in this very moment... The Holy Spirit is showing you something, and it's time to say, I know what he's talking about in my life. And in these moments, we should call out to God right here, whatever it is, say, God, I understand that that thing that I think would satisfy me is, is a lie. And the reality is sin never satisfies. Look at, look again at those celebrities. Look at the people through generations and generations who go to the well. Then they go to another well and to another well, hoping to be satisfied that whatever that well offers at that particular time, it, it won't satisfy. The bait is keeping you from seeing the lie. And so we recognize it for what it is. We take responsibility for it. We realize how it works and where it leads. But here's the fourth way that we deal with temptation this morning. We must remember who our God is. We just went pretty deep into some, some bad stuff there through verses 16. But James now, what does he do? He begins to shift our focus off of us and our junk onto God, a good and holy God who is awesome there in verse 17. He says, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He's saying, remember, in the midst of all the junk that's around you, fix your eyes on the one who never changes. Fix your eyes on the awesome, perfect, powerful, grace-giving God who only gives good gifts to his children. And so what does this do for us? This makes us realize that I don't fight temptation in my own strength. James is saying, look to God. God, the one who never changes. You and I, by our own willpower, cannot beat temptation. We may defeat it for just a little while. We can't do it our own. We can't fight off sin, but only by his power can we do that. And here's the picture for us this morning. Every single day, you and I are constantly getting knocks on the door. Knocks on the door, constant knocks for temptation. Constant knocks to go somewhere where we have no business going. Constant knocks to go and sin and be tempted and to jump into some things that honestly are going to bring death into our life. 
And sometimes what we do is we just walk up to the door, we open up the door, and we say, come on in. We're the hospitality state, right? We shouldn't be hospitable that way. Instead of going and opening the door, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to go the other way and pick up the phone of prayer and call out to God who is our Father. He is the Father of lights. He's the good, grace-giving God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from Him. He does not change. And you don't have to wonder what's on the other side of the door with God. He gives grace and He gives mercy. And that's why it says of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. And what does that mean? Friends, He saved you. He saved you. Don't forget that in the middle of your temptation, James is telling us this, this is the, the guy that saved you from your sin. Turn your eyes from the things that are tempting to our God who can save you out of those temptations. We have to recognize temptation for what it is and what it is not. We have to take responsibility for it. And we have to realize how it works and, and where it leads and most importantly, Friends, I want you to know, and you need to understand, you need to remember who our God is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a chance to be in your word this morning. Thank you for teaching us through your word. God, I pray this morning that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would convict our hearts. God, that you would apply the truths of your words to our hearts, that we may walk in obedience to you. That, Lord, that we may discover and experience victory over temptation in our lives. God, that we no longer be lured away and baited and enticed by the sinful temptations of the world. But, Lord, through the victory, Lord, that you've promised us through Jesus Christ, Lord, that we can be victorious over these things. Father, I pray for everyone in this room at this very moment, for everyone that's watching us on live stream at this very moment. God, that we would understand what temptation does, that it brings death. Lord, that we would fix our eyes upon you, the good, gracious, giving God who never changes. And Lord, that we would experience victory over this temptation. And Father, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, if you're here today and you are walking through these trials of temptation right now, and it is having its way with you, what you need to understand this morning is this, is you can't beat it on your own. But through a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can be victorious over whatever it is that you're walking through. And some of you have never come to that point in your life where you've trusted Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life. And therefore, you don't have those resources to tap into to experience victory over this temptation. And today is the day where you need to get to the point in your life where you need to pour your heart out to God and say, God, I need you. God, I'm a sinner. And this day I am turning from my sin and I am turning towards you. I'm going to trust what you've done for me on the cross. You see, Jesus went to the cross to pay the debt for, for your sin and my sin. A debt that we could never pay, a debt that he never owed. And he died so that we can be in right relationship with God. And the resurrection tells us as a testimony that God has accepted that sacrifice so that we could be made right with him. But only until you trust Christ. Can you experience that victory? Because then you're given that gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell you, to walk with you, to be victorious in the midst of those situations. And so I want to invite you to come this morning. I'll be standing right here. I want to pray for you. We want to walk with you. But here's where I got real personal with the, with the, with the first service. And you could have heard a pin drop just like I'm about to be over here, a pin drop. I am not naive to think that every one of us in this room is dealing with something. Because I am. Every one of us are. And I don't do this for show, and this will never be about show, but some of you need to be on your face here in just a moment. Whether it's right here, whether it's in your pew where you're sitting. Because listen to me. If we can't get to the point in a place where we can pour our hearts out to the Lord in repentance and hear, we've missed it. We have absolutely missed it. This ought to be a safe place where we can do just that. And friends, and in just a moment, if somebody walks an aisle and gets down on the floor, 
You ought to be with them. We all ought to be with them. And if somebody comes, you come and pray over them. You pray together. I've been pastoring for over 20 years now. I don't even know how many years it is now. You just kind of quit keeping up with it after a while. We go through junk, don't we? Anybody got any junk going on in your life? You just think, maybe it's going to get easier one day. And you ain't hit that one day just yet, have you? But until then, we need to remember who our great God is. And he wants to walk with you. But you got to get to that point in your life, that place in your life where you're desperate. And some of us are just not desperate enough yet. We're still trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That's never worked out for anybody, and it's not going to work out for you because you're not an exception. We all think we're the exception to spiritual rules. No, that's the father of lies speaking that to you. So as we sing this song, this song of response, if God is working in your life today, don't squelch it. Be obedient. Let the people around you be obedient. Have compassion for them and be willing to walk with them during those difficult times. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. As morning dawns. As morning dawns. Nothing has the power to save but your name through Jesus. Amen. This morning, if you are a guest with us, we're honored that you're here with us. If you're sitting on the floor, there should be in the pew rack in front of you a connection card. If you'll take that and fill that out. And right out here in our Next Step Center, we have somebody who wants to trade you a filled out connection card for a goodie bag. And they will do that out there. Or if you just feel comfortable want to drop it in one of the offering boxes before you leave today, you can also worship through giving by dropping your offering in those offering boxes. A couple things to remind you of that are in the bulletin. One is... Um, uh, those of you who are able to be a part of our ice cream fellowship and, um, and our uh, fundraiser, our bake auction fundraiser last week, we had a great time. And it was a time to laugh. And uh, I'm still laughing at some of that stuff. And, and, um, and Jared, Jared, you blessed my heart, brother. You blessed my heart. And you keep us on our toes. And I praise God for you every day. And um, so anyway, our goal was about $2,700. I think we wound up between thirty-two dollars and $3,300. So thank you for that. 
Um, that basically means that our students, they all had to pay their initial deposit, but after that, they were able to cover the cost for the rest of their camp. So thank you guys for participating and showing up and helping out with that. Uh, so next Sunday night, we have our night of prayer. We've done this before, and we want to do it again, where we're just gathering together on a Sunday evening, no sermon. We're just going to pray. We're going to pray strategically and specifically for the things, specifically some things that we have going on this summer, some ministries that we do need to spend some time praying for. I want to encourage you to be here at five o'clock it's such a sweet time of worship and then we have vacation bible school coming up june 6th through the 9th and so if you have not pre-registered we want to encourage you to pre-register mr jerome is already pre-registered for the second grade class he's going to be that for vacation bible school this week and so you can go online to pre-register you can go to our website and uh you can go to uh first baptist click here and it'll take you to a, a form to be able to register or or if you're on Realm, you can do it very specifically and very quickly that way also. Also, next week, this Wednesday night, right after our midweek gathering over in the fellowship hall, we're going to have a teacher and volunteer meeting. The, uh, the VBS director has spoken, and she is calling in the troops. And so she's going to get us all in line. I want to encourage you to be there. Join us for midweek. We, uh, we're not eating right now. We won't pick up our meals again until about the second week of August. But we just have had a great time just in converse, walking through Psalm 119. And we're going to do that again this week. And last week was such a, a rich, rich time. And I want to encourage you to be there for us as well. Other things in the bulletin, uh, pay attention and you will do well. We're going to take about a five-minute break after I pray. And we're going to have our regular scheduled first family meeting. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the moment that we have to gather. Father, thank you for the gift of the church. Thank you for the opportunity to walk with each other, Lord, to, to live life with each other. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can experience victory because of Jesus and what he has accomplished for us. Father, we, may we stay clean and may we stay close so that we may walk in your victory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful